Welcome to the Brothers Grimm Seeds and Friends podcast. I'm Mark Eden and I'm your host, but I'm also today the guest and I'm going to give everybody who's interested in learning to grow some do-it-yourself instructions. It's a little bit of a video explainer to get you growing weed at home for the first time or if you're struggling, uh, let's get you growing properly. Now I teach a simple system and I, I say that it's simple because there's a lot of ways to grow and a lot of ways to approach it. But if you're looking for putting in the least amount of work but also getting super high quality weed, then this system will work. I don't recommend following several teachers and piecing together a system of your own. So don't cherry pick from 20 videos and try to make your own first home grow work. Instead, follow one simple system from one teacher. Highly recommend mine. Growing at home is fun. It's positive. There's gardening therapy involved. It's not just about the end harvest. All you need for supplies besides the grow light, which is a 315 CMH light, stands for ceramic metal halide, is a grow tent. And I recommend Gorilla Grow Tent. You can get a 3x3, a 4x4, a 4x8, a 6x6. They have lots of sizes to choose from and they last forever. Gorilla Grow Tents are not chintzy, the zippers don't break, and the fabric doesn't rip. So that's why I'm emphasizing start with a really good grow tent, otherwise they fall apart. Plastic pots. Well, you might need six plastic pots or 12, depends on how many you wanna grow and fill up in your grow tent, but I highly recommend plastic pots because it's gonna keep your soil moist. And that's what we wanna do the whole time you're growing is keep the soil moist. We don't want to let it get dry. And with fabric pots, they get real dry too fast, too easy. So a uh, plastic pot really works great in an indoor home grow in a grow tent. Other supplies are your Vibosun pump sprayer. Now I name off that brand because this pump sprayer lasts and lasts and lasts. I just can't believe that it's lasting me so long because I used to bust all kinds of pump sprayers. They just don't last, they break. Anyway, the Vivosun pump sprayer lasts a long time and I have two, one for watering the soil and another for the pest control sprays. You also have a hygrometer, a soil moisture reader, and a jeweler scope on your list, as well as a light timer and a dehumidifier and humidifier. You'll also need an exhaust fan for your grow tent and a small clip-on fan as well. Last but not least, you're gonna need some soil and some fertilizer. Now, if you get a bag of soil like Happy Frog or Roots Organics or Dr. Earth's, they come pre-fertilized. So for the first 30 days, you don't need to add any other fertilizer to your soil. And you could basically just buy some fertilizer for your flowering phase. And for fertilizers, you know, you have Dr. Earth's powder fertilizer as a uh, immediate option available on Amazon and everywhere. Or you could level up and get something special like Tony's Magic Mix and Tony's Magic Flower, which is just a super premium top dressing. So yeah, that's what we do. We, f we feed the soil with some organic top dressings and that's it for fertilizing. Step one, get your grow space ready before you pop your seeds. What I mean by that is set up your grow tent, hang your grow lights, hang your exhaust fan, check the temperature and the humidity of the environment you're in, and to, to see if you need to add a humidifier or a dehumidifier right away. You'll want to get your temps to around 70 to 85 degrees while you're growing, so I'm sure your temperatures will be pretty fine and good to go, but it's usually the humidity that might give you a challenge because if the humidity is 30% relative humidity, that's just very low and young plants don't like it. Your tents can be zipped up with the exhaust fan on and that might work for you, but you could also keep the, the grow tent unzipped. That's totally fine too because, hey, why not? You, you might not want the light blasting out into people's eyeball view, but if you have a bedroom that has, has a grow tent in it, feel free to keep the grow tent open, not necessarily closed all the time. However, when you're in flower phase, you do need complete darkness. So you wouldn't want to keep the, the grow tent open if it was in a room that lights are being turned on. 
And with all that said and done, you're ready to get your hands dirty and get your plants going. So, step two. Step two is put your seed in a cup of water. Take that cup of water, that tap water, and go ahead and pop it in the cupboard, in a nice dark cupboard. And that's where you're going to wait a day or two, or maybe three if it's a real big seed. And you're going to wait until the roots start showing. Once those roots start showing, you're ready to plant your seed. Yes, you can use store-bought water and you can use distilled water and spring water, but the tap water is fine unless you're in an environment where you know your tap water is extremely tainted. Then sure, go ahead and get some spring water from the store or some distilled water. Otherwise, growing with tap water in your soil is gonna be fine and popping your seeds in tap water is totally fine. Step three, prepare your pot. Get your pot, fill it up with soil, and then get it real wet and stir it and mix it real good. I mean, preferably stick your hands in and mix it up. But if you're scared of that and don't want to get your fingernails dirty, then you can use a shovel or a spoon or use something, put gloves on. But you really got to mix that soil up with the water and get it all equally distributed and nice and moist. You don't want it soupy wet, so let it drain. And sometimes if you're a home grower, you're gonna choose to water your plants and do your soil preparations in a shower stall or your back patio or in the basement or in the garage, because it is a little bit messy. But yeah, if you're in an apartment, the shower stall is a great easy way to prepare your plants for um, getting the soil all nice and moist. Not too wet, just moist. So give it plenty of time to drizzle down the drain before you plant your seedling and yeah, you're off. Step four, plant your sprout. Now that you have your little sprout, you can put a small half inch hole in the top of your soil and you can put this little guy root up. Plant it root up and then sprinkle the soil on top and just wait and watch. Within a few days, that seedling's gonna pop up. Step five, for the next few days, do nothing. Just watch and wait, be patient. The seedling's going to emerge and you don't need to do anything. You don't need to water it and you only need to remove the cap, uh, the seed head, if there is one. You can use your fingertips or a tweezer to remove those seed caps if you see it. Other than that, just watch and wait and it will come. Step six is how to water your seedling. Well, you've got a pump sprayer for spraying the topsoil. That's number one. And when you notice the topsoil is dry just by sight and visual touch, feel free to spray the topsoil. However, for the first week or two, your soil is going to be quite moist from that original day of getting all of your soil wet. You don't need to water very much in the seedling phase at all. So the first couple weeks, I'm just spraying the topsoil, getting the first few inches and keeping that moist. Everything down below does tend to stay nice and wet and moist. And the way you double check yourself is you use a soil moisture reader. The soil moisture reader is gonna help tell you if the soil is dry, moist, or wet. Uh, moist is ideal. Wet is, you know, you'll see that after a fresh watering, but ideally you want to stay in the moist zone. And if it starts getting towards the dry, uh, the red area, then you definitely need to water. And you just don't ever want to get into the dry zone. When you're growing in soil indoors with these plastic pots, the goal is to keep the soil moist at all times. Step seven is support your seedling as necessary. You might notice your seedling toppling over and that's common, no worries. All you need to do is pull the soil up around the base and the stem and give it an extra support. Now you can raise the seedling up closer to the light or lower the light if you buy some uh, light hangers, which allows you to have a little pulley and you can raise and lower your lights. Otherwise, just grab another pot or a cylinder, a uh, brick, and bring it up closer to the light and that will help some of that stretching. Some strains will grow more tall and lanky than others. 
So during the seedling phase, it's not uncommon to have to smush that soil up and give it more support so it doesn't fall over. Or you can add like a little plant marker or a pencil and give it a little support, something to lean on. Step eight is pest control sprays. It's something that you just have to do. Really, in veg, all you're doing is watering, pest control sprays, and plant maintenance. So your pest control spray that I recommend is Organicide. You can buy it as ready to spray, or you can buy the concentrated version and mix it yourself. Highly recommend the concentrated version because it's just way cheaper. And with the concentrated version, you need one gallon of water for three ounces of liquid uh, Organicide, which is, comes out to be three shot glasses full. You mix that up and you spray the tops of the leaves, the bottoms of the leaves, up and down the stems and stalks, as well as on the topsoil. Another product that you'll want to stock up on, just in case you have fungus gnats, is a product called Mosquito Bits. Mosquito Bits will kill the fungus gnat larva in the soil and just completely stop the cycle of fungus gnats. Now, fungus gnats typically arrive when you're overwatering. So that's another reason why you don't want to overwater because it becomes a breeding ground for fungus gnats. But you'll have mosquito bits on hand. And yes, it's on label. It's right on the label that you can use mosquito bits for killing fungus gnats. So that's about it for pest control. It's really not hard and you can stay on your pest control with those sprays until about second week of flower. Once you see those flowers, Growers don't want to be spraying flowers. You can very meticulously spray the leaves if you're careful and not spray your flowers. And some people do do that. It depends on whether or not you're really in an environment where you do get a lot of pests. And we're talking about thrips, aphids, spider mites, but also diseases like powdery mildew. Hopefully you won't have any pest problems. You'll do your sprays. You'll have mosquito bits on hand just in case you get some fungus gnats and you'll be good to go with no problems. Step nine is plant maintenance. Now, very simply, I want you to remember this. Remove sucker branches. It's just like gardening tomatoes. You don't want those little small sucker branches on the bottom of the plant that don't get close up to the light. Now, ultimately, the light is penetrating down and all the tops of your flowers, where your flowers are, those are going to be nice big buds. And then way down below are going to be what we call larf. And it's just small little popcorn buds and larfy buds that are soft and small and scraggly. Anyway, you can eliminate that by just cutting off all those sucker branches and veg. And sometimes you got to cut them off in flower too. This way, all the energy of the plant goes to the tops of those flowers and all those tops of your flowers are going to get as big as possible and you don't have to mess with all those little tiny buds. Now, if you do have a lot of little tiny buds in the larf down there, then you can harvest that and you can still smoke it or you can cook with it. You know, you can infuse it into butter and oil quite easily. There's lots of recipes online for that and that's the kind of trim that you would use for making some do-it-yourself edibles at home. Step 10 is flipping to flower phase, which your flower phase lighting schedule is going to be 12 hours on, 12 hours off. You'll be flipping the flower around week five, week six in veg. And I'm talking about from the day you planted the seedling and it sprouted uh, five to six to seven weeks later. I've seen a, you know, I flipped as soon as day 30, which is one whole month. So I did it for a one month after that seedling sprouted. And then after one month, I changed the lighting cycle to the flower phase lighting. You can do it after one month. You can do it after five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks. It's really up to you. It depends on how high your grow tent is. If you bought a shorty grow tent, you're going to need to grow shorter plants and you're not going to want them to grow as tall. So you might actually then be looking at flipping the flower around week, the end of week four or in week five. In the flower phase, it needs to be pitch black. It needs to be uninterrupted dark time. So don't mess that up. <laughs> Step 11 is flower fertilizer. You don't really need to add this until around, let's say week five or week six of the plant's entire life, because let's 
Just assume you start with a fresh bag of soil that already had plenty of fertilizer and nutrients in it. But now is the time when you're flipping into flour that you can start adding some of this powder nutrient to the soil, whether it's Dr. Earth's or Tony's Magic Mix or whatever else you find out there. But these top dressing approaches with the soil are the way to go and it's affordable. And in the future, you can reuse your soil and keep reamending it with these fertilizers I keep talking about, Dr. Earth's and Tony's Magic Mix. All in all, all you're doing in flower phase is continuing to water. You're still removing some sucker branches and you're monitoring the temperature and the humidity. That's really how you can provide the best life for your plants and the best opportunity for it to be uh, mind-blowing cannabis that you grew at home yourself. Step 12, give yourself a pat on the back. Growing weed for the first time is a rewarding accomplishment. Step 13 is harvesting your cannabis. How do you know when to harvest? How do you know when to chop it down? Well, there's quite a few different approaches, but all in all, remember you're following a flowering time suggestion. So your, your seeds that you buy will come with recommendations of six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks flowering time, maybe nine weeks flowering time. But there are other things that you can look at to know that your plant is getting ripe and mature, ready to harvest. The white hairs will all be turning red and orange and brown. There may be still a few white hairs around, but the vast majority of them tend to be turning those other colors. You'll also use your trichome scope during this time to evaluate the trichome colors on your buds. And if you're the kind of person that wants weed that's going to knock you out, lay you out on the couch, glue you to the couch, the couch, glue you to the couch, then go ahead and over ripen your cannabis. And by this, I mean, keep growing longer than the suggested flowering time and look at the trichomes under your scope for amber colored trichomes and wait till you see almost 50% amber colored trichomes. And this could take a while, but if you do over ripen it like that, that cannabis will be whew, gluing you to the couch. And then on the opposite hand, you can also under ripen and kind of pull your harvest early too. And that is known for giving folks more of a cerebral buzz. So by that, I mean, if most of the trichome colors are clear, then you would know that it's uh, not quite mature, ripe, and harvest ready. Uh, the colors milky white and creamy white are the colors that would describe the trichomes being perfectly uh, ready for harvest, where the, the THC is just um, going to be perfect and it hasn't yet converted over to CBN, because that's what happens when the white turns to amber color. Uh, ultimately, there's THC and it's converting to CBN. And CBN has a reputation for making most people feel very tired. Works for most people, not everybody. So all you're doing in step 13 is chopping down the crop, hanging it upside down, and putting in an environment or a room where there's around 50 to 60 degrees relative humidity and around 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit for temperature. Great environment for drying your cannabis. There are also great products like Canatrol, which is kind of looks like a fridge, but it's more than a fridge and it controls water vapor in the air, which really dictates what humidity is. So those products are quite expensive, but if you're gonna be growing for life, then you can use the Canatrol system to dry your cannabis and store it. And something about storing it is really important because if you store it in an environment where it's really, really hot, then you can expect that cannabis to degrade quickly. Uh, so storing cannabis in a system like Canatrol will help preserve and keep it for a much longer time. And I'm talking about keeping it smelling really wonderful and uh, even to the point where it's still a little sticky. You know, you want sticky buds. You don't just want buds that are dry and brittle and fall apart. Your weed should stick up against the wall and that's how you know it's on point. Step 14, you're drying your cannabis. If you're drying your cannabis and you're hanging it in a room with about 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 50 to 65 degrees relative humidity, then it's gonna take about 
10 to 14 days for you to dry it just right. Probably better for you to go 10 to 14 days than try to be done with it in a week. Uh, if you're trying to rush the dry, that's not a good thing and you're better off taking a little bit more time and waiting. You don't have to wait for the branches to snap. You want them to be close to snapping and that's where you're gonna find um, you're ahead of the game because a lot of teaching out there calls for a heavy snap. You need all the branches to snap and that's not the case. Uh, so don't worry about if you're harvesting and it's almost snapping, but just not quite. And again, the control system will help you dial in the perfect temperature and humidity for drying and curing and storing your cannabis over the long haul. I can't emphasize how valuable that is because you don't want to go through all this work growing, you know, four months in total growing to get the product that then, oh, it's summertime and now it's dry as a bone. Uh, you know, if you don't have the Canatrol money, then you could also get a wine cooler to store your buds long-term. Uh, I wouldn't dry it and cure it in there, but for long-term storage, go ahead and airtight seal that jar up and put it in there for long-term storage. Uh, nobody wants dry, brittle cannabis and keep it, keep it good. Step 15 is storing your cannabis. Uh, I recommend storing it in glass mason jars and you can also add humidity packs in those jars and those humidity packs will help keep the humidity at a hopeful, you know, around 60 or 58 degrees relative humidity. Of course, if you have the Canatrol, you can keep it and store it in the Canatrol. Or if you have a wine fridge, you can also put those jars of weed into the wine fridge. Just, you know, screw that lid on tight, put the, put the moisture bag in it, and you'll be good to go. Don't store it in a hot environment where it's going to be in the 80s, and it's just going to dry out fast, and then you'll lose all that flavor, and you'll lose a lot of the potency even. So... Take good care of that cannabis that you worked so hard on, or at least, you know, you, you, you gave it a lot of love, a lot of TLC, tender love and care to get that THC that you're after. But don't just focus on THC. You gotta realize there's terpenes and there's all kinds of terpenes in cannabis giving it aroma, giving it flavor, and giving it effects. So you gotta consider the terpenes if you're really trying to choose a strain to grow, not just what's the THC. Uh, THC, 15 to 20%. There's wonderful weed at 15 to 20% that will get you feeling amazing, all kinds of great highs. You don't need the 20 to 25 or the 25 to 30 or the 30 plus. Uh, for a lot of people, when you smoke the 30 plus, it's actually not a pleasant experience, but it depends on the person. So experiment and try. Just don't rule out low, low percentage THC flower because often the terps are exotic and amazing and you're missing out. Home growing is a forever hobby. So I just want to help you get started, get you on the right path. And I believe if you follow this system and take my planning and strategy into your home grow, you're going to be successful from the beginning. So get some seeds today from brothersgrimseeds.com. Check out the description for all links to many other products that you'll need in your home grow and hopefully you'll be growing soon and showing your friends your dank weed. If you have extra, share with a friend and let them know that you're growing at home. Seriously, don't wait, don't sleep on home grow, uh, jump in the game. Hopefully you heard this system and realized that, you know, that's a pretty simple, easy system. He's not asking us to do much and I'm not. You know, you don't have to top, you don't have to super crop, you don't have to defoliate. Uh, let it be, just relax, just chill. Watch your plants grow. Look forward to your check-ins. Like when I say check in with your plants, I mean check in with them, you know, walk up and down, look at all of them. Make sure you look at all of them every day. I'm not saying to water every day and spray them with anything every day. Just check on them, look at them, make sure they're happy and healthy. And you know, the signs of a happy, healthy plant are leaves praying to the light, so look for those leaves to pray to the light. If they're drooping or wilting, then something's not right in the soil. Usually it's overwatering, but it could even be an underwatering. It could be a situation where the root ball is dry, but all the, the rest of the soil is moist and wet. Now that does happen from uh, time to time, but you know, they, those 
sloppy watering. Avoid sloppy watering. A sloppy watering is having a jug of water or a pitcher of water and just, just throw it in there and walk away. That's not how we're watering. We're, we're spray watering the soil and it's slowly dispersing throughout and it's doing it evenly and it's really, that's a good water. Sloppy watering is just throwing water in there and walking away. So no sloppy watering. Sloppy watering leads to uh, parts of the pot that don't get wet and they end up getting dry and then part of the pot is dry and part of the pot is uh, moist. Um, better off to use those pump sprayers and enjoy the journey. It's not about the destination, it is about the journey. Enjoy the garden and stay tuned. You're gonna see my garden and see how simple I keep it just so that I can have my own cannabis that I've grown at home that to me makes my world go around. It will for you too. Okay.